Hey, okay, welcome. Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us here today. My name is Robin Lee. I coordinate the Connector program here at the Cape Breton Partnership. Uh, we're thrilled to partner with CBU alumni to offer this new webinar series. Uh, this is the webinar that I needed when I was a new graduate. Uh, financial health is it, for some people can be incredibly intimidating and we're just so lucky because the two speakers that we have uh, make financial health and the steps toward that and the steps toward owning a house uh, understandable accessible and for someone like me they just really take the mystery out of it uh, and I also think it's important to see how accessible the people behind uh, buying a house or behind your your local credit union or bank are um, so really it's just a I'm just someone who's really excited to <clears throat> excuse me welcome them um, so one of the partnerships roles is to attract and retain cal talent for Cape Breton companies and to help that talent stay here and so we're just thrilled to be able to offer something like this that's helping uh, alumni live and thrive here um, if you're a new grad and you would like to grow your professional network, please reach out to me. Uh, the Connector program introduces new graduates and relocated Canadians and newcomers to industry leaders in their field. We work with uh, more CBU alumni than with any other group. Um, and that's both in the new graduates we work with, but also the industry leaders, um, like the ones you were having in the webinar today, are, are often CBU alumni. Um, and we are especially thrilled to host this webinar series with CBU alumni. Uh, so before we get started, I'm just going to ask my colleague, Jeremy, to describe some of the functions of this platform. Thank you very much, Robin Lee. Thanks a lot for coming out today, everyone. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this series or with how this all works, um, we're using the Zoom platform and the webinar function for this. So uh, the first thing I'll let you know is that number one, um, we will not be able to see you or hear you. Don't worry if you have to get up and uh, go to the bathroom or if you have to sneeze or cough or whatever, um, we can't see you. So don't worry about that. Uh, you can only see and hear us. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please click the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you'll see with two little speech bubbles above it. Um, uh, ask your questions there and our presenters will see them. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to answer all the questions then and uh, get to you one at a time. Uh, we'll also have the chat function down below that you'll see. So if you have any technical difficulties or anything doesn't seem to be working or you're not hearing us, please just type in there uh, whatever comment you have and we'll uh, get a hold of you as soon as we can in order to figure out the problem. Um, in the meantime, please enjoy, have a great day, and Robin Lee, back over to you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so now I would like to introduce one of the fabulous organizers of this event. She's the annual giving specialist with CBU alumni, Rochelle Hatcher. Thank you, Robin Lee, and thank you to everyone who is registered on our webinar today. We have lots of uh, alumni and alumni friends, friends of CBU. We are especially grateful today and a big shout out to Robin Lee and Jeremy and the collaboration with the Cape Breton Partnership. We couldn't have done this series without them. We have another webinar next week, which is the last one in our series called Refresh My Resume. Today, I'm really excited to have Allison and Yanni. I mean, Allison and Yanni are leaders in Cape Breton. They're experts in their field. Allison uh, has so much community experience, has so many contacts. If you have questions, if you're even thinking about buying a house in the next few years, Allison is the person that you want to connect with now, and she's always accessible. Yanni is an amazing financial expert. I can't wait for you to hear from him. He was actually awarded last year from our alumni board, um, Young Alumni of the Year. So really incredible people. And if you're not getting information uh, from alumni through email, um, make sure that you pop on to cbu.ca slash alumni, update your contact information. It just takes a minute. That's where you're gonna receive all of the information about the free webinars that we host. You can connect with us if you're trying to get in touch with some industry experts um, similar to today. We can definitely help connect you. Um, CBU family is more than 25,000 graduates and they're worldwide. Our CBU alumni are experts in their field. They're nurses, teachers, engineers, they're entrepreneurs, they're athletes. They are worldwide and they are leaders. So definitely get in touch with us. 
follow us on all of our uh, platforms. We're now on LinkedIn. Follow us on social media, including Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. That's where you're going to see all of our updates on anything that we have happening, including upcoming events um, similar to this webinar. And last month, we were very proud, although times are very different, but we had 1,400 graduates um, from CBU, the largest graduating class ever. We're very proud of all of our new graduates, and uh, we definitely want to stay connected. So back over to you, Robin Lee. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Okay. So our first panelist graduated from CBU in 2011 with a BBA and will graduate again this fall with an MBA. In 2019, he was a recipient of CBU Alumni's Outstanding Young Alumni Award. Yanni is he's currently manager of the branch and commercial banking for the Sydney Credit Union. And so we welcome to the video Yanni Harbis. Thank you for that nice introduction. I was making fun of all the panelists because they didn't have their CBU alumni pin and mine just fell off. So I appreciate, I appreciate the, the nice introduction and we'll get right into it. Uh, I believe Robin Lee said, that, there we go, I think we can see my screen there. I believe Robin Lee said I'm going to be graduating this, uh, this fall. I sure hope so. I've been pushing that back a little bit with the research paper for the MBA. Uh, however, let's, let's cross our fingers and that, that does happen. My boss is uh, watching this call here, or this webinar here. So if, if you guys have any comments to him to give me some more free time to be able to finish that, that would be great. Joking aside. Okay. So the purpose of today's agenda is to ensure you are properly set up with some very basic fun. Oh, Yep, with some very basic fundamentals of financial planning as you prepare or getting ready to prepare for your biggest purchase of your life, which is really buying a house. And Allison's going to go through a lot of that detail. Uh, I want to go through a little bit of the initial steps to get you guys prepared for success. Uh, I'm going to quickly state that financial planning, specifically budgeting and setting, setting oneself up for success isn't rocket science. Um, but where it is not taught in high schools or university, I feel it's important to get a basic understanding. So a lot of this is not going to be rocket science, like I said. And then based on experience um, and statistics uh, in the Canadian demographic, you know, our debt levels here in Canada are skyrocketing every single year. And so then needless to say, very, very important. And then, you know, to add to that, when individuals come to see myself or any of our team here at the credit union, we try to work with them through financial literacy, but it would have been great if they were properly educated to start and then they could have got into their home a bit quicker. So the agenda, establishing realistic goals, budgeting, best practices. If I can leave you guys with anything, anything at all would be the third bullet is paying yourself first and the power of compounding. And then we'll get into credit. And so we'll talk about student loans very briefly. We'll talk about bad debt and good debt, credit cards, and potentially some, some stuff about the credit bureau. Any specific questions, it may be best that you ask uh, in the Q&A and we can answer those specific questions about that because there's a lot of information and unfortunately we won't be able to get through all of it. And then I'm just going to share some resources and references that I use and hopefully, like I said, we get into some questions. So establishing goals and specifically, you know, having a plan of attack. So in my opinion, I, I usually write them down and I follow it and then I revisit it on a quarterly basis to take, see where I am and, and where my gap is. Um, so short-term and long-term goals, which could be paying off education, traveling, more education, or whatever the case is. And in, in our case today, it'll, it'll be you know buying a home. Ordered and level of priority, very important. So on top of being ordered in the level of priority, having a time horizon as to when these goals are meant to be met is, is very paramount as well. So as an example, you know, my children are turning five next week. And, and so then as a result, the goal of mine is to pay for their education where my parents couldn't. Uh, however, that's more of a long-term goal and maybe not a priority at the, at the moment for me, but yet still on the back burner and something I need to save for. Realistic versus unrealistic goals. So I use the, the, the quote, living like the Joneses. 
um, you know, and and I think that's fine and dandy. However, there's some things, there's needs and wants, there's discretionary and non-discretionary. And, and I think sometimes as well, and, and one of the resources I'll share is the wealthy barber, uh, but sometimes it's a matter of actually saying no because we need to sacrifice in order to get to our goals, whether whether financially um, or, or personally. The other thing I wanted to quickly talk about, about realistic versus unrealistic before we get into budgeting, is richness uh, does not need to be defined as rich in terms of material things or, or cargo. Um, it could be many different things. Uh, so richness should not define, you know, one's one's life in terms of money. However, stability in money does help in terms of catapulting into different endeavors, switching a job. Uh, during COVID, there's been a lot of uncertainty with employment. So for some, it might might have been, you know, having three months of, of emergency funds available to get them through, uh, you know, some, some tough times, albeit uh, I do know the government provided the CERB uh, program. But nonetheless, I think you, you get my point with that. So, so again, Money is one of the principles of success, as Napoleon Hill will state, but not, not everything rests on money, it just helps. Some, some resources I had, yeah, I wanted to share just a couple resources that I, that I had when I first had graduated. One of them was Wealthy Barber. I think, uh, well, actually, the Wealthy Barber Returns, uh, the Wealthy Barber Returns adds in the tax-free savings account. If anyone's getting interested in money or, or saving or financial planning, the Wealthy Barber is a very easy book to read. In fact, I read it before I started banking, and uh, I very much liked it, hence why I got into banking. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill uh, is a very good book as well, one of the best sellers I think ever in terms of self, self-help and uh, financial planning of sorts. And then Outwitting the Devil, again, is by Napoleon Hill, and uh, it just talks about a, a lot of different things, which I won't get into today, but essentially just a definiteness of purpose and, uh, and uh, you know, aspiring to, to whatever it is that, that one will aspire to. Okay, budgeting. I do have a, a short story I want to share about budgeting and why it's important and just, uh, I guess, back to, to the living like the Joneses. So growing up, my, my father immigrated to Canada. We lived a very low-income lifestyle. Uh, the majority of my youth, we didn't have anything fancy. You know, no, no nice cars. They were always used. We had a Reliant K, if anyone knows what that is. Uh, but my dad was continuously budgeting and then rebudgeting to ensure we were always provided for, my brother and I. I think it annoyed my mom quite a bit. Uh, however, uh, my, you know, so I learned from an early age about the importance of budgeting. So my dad, my dad would always save a little bit, never a lot, and he never spent needlessly. Uh, at family get-togethers, you know, everyone would brag about their toys and their gadgets and make snarky remarks about our small home, etc. But my dad had goals, uh, and those goals were leveled in priority. We wanted a small mortgage because we wanted to travel to Greece every single year and give us as, as kids, my brother and I, the best chance to be the athletes we thought we were going to be. I thought I was going to be a way better athlete than I was, but nonetheless. Uh, so Larry, long story, uh, today these same family members come to my dad for loans. Uh, my dad still makes a little income. He always did. And these individuals always made fixed income salaries and have nothing to show for it. So it just goes to show, I guess, the importance of a budget and, uh, and really understanding needs versus wants. Especially, I guess I could also add, as a student who's just coming out with potentially some debts, you know, we might want a new house, we might want a new $70,000 truck, live in the penthouse apartment, et cetera. You know, maybe, maybe something a budget could could suggest that maybe we need to scale back a little bit. My first apartment was a basement apartment in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland, otherwise known as Shelbyville, with pink carpet, and my wife cried every single night for six months until we bought our first place, uh, just to show sometimes about the sacrifice. So what is a budget? A detailed list of income and expenses. How much money is coming in? How much money is going out? It's a tool to use. Um, it also helps make goals reality, right? It's, for example, it's, it's a tad easier for me to save $100 a week as opposed to, for a year as opposed to putting $5,200 away in a lump sum. If I did a weekly on my paycheck and paying myself first, it would be a lot easier. And with any financial planner, you're going to run through a budget because we got to make sure those goals are realistic before we get into it. So 
in terms of creating a budget, and I did, uh, I think you guys can see this, I did, I will add this to my, to the resources after the fact, but I gave you guys a My Money Coach tool here. And so I'll just quickly, you know, you put your name, you say what type of budget I'm trying to do, I really need to tight up, tighten up my finances or get back on track or my finances are fine. And I just want to make sure I stay on track. You say how many people you support. My advice would be to leave the budgeting guide and tips on. And then you go through each different pool of money that you may spend and all the money that's coming in. And over here, it kind of says where you're at. And then it also compares it to, to Canadian standards. And then when you're completely done, when you go over to more, it actually gives you suggestions as where you can cut expenses or save or, or whatnot. So that will be provided there. I, I believe an email will get sent out after the fact. So when I create a budget, I, I do discretionary versus non-discretionary. So what do I have to pay? So, so non-discretionary, meaning my rent, uh, my utilities, my debt repayment, my savings, because I'm saving for a home, uh, would be considered non-discretionary. And then my discretionary spending, uh, my outings, my lifestyle, my spending cash, my cable, stuff like that. Just quickly on cable, I, I didn't want to talk about it, but, you know, especially in today's day and age, from a savings perspective, you know, cable's 200, 250 bucks a month, you know, you times 250 by 12, there's three grand a month that you really, you could have just had internet and had, you know, your whatnots on there, your DAZN, your Netflix, et cetera, and essentially save two grand at the end of the year. That's pretty powerful stuff because over, over five years, that's 10 grand that you really didn't spend. So that's the difference between the discretionary and non-discretionary spending. Emergency savings. So I, I did allude to emergency savings a little bit, uh, mainly from a, from a generic perspective. You, you, you always like to have at least three to six months of emergency savings in the event of an emergency, such as COVID-19 or, or whatnot. Uh, and that emergency savings, essentially, it, it's a nice little nest egg and a peace of mind, if you will, that, you know, depending on what happens or something I can rely on. Pay yourself first. So, like I said, if we could, if I could let you take anything away, especially as you save for a home, et cetera, it would be to pay yourself first. Essentially, what, what that means is make saving a bill payment. So every single week I get paid $100, 50 of those dollars after, after my non-discretionary spending has been spent. Um, you know, that goes into a savings account no matter what and it's forgotten. You know, and I guess the principle that I'm speaking about is essentially zero-based budgeting. So my checking account, for example, I get paid and I have different pools of money that, that my paycheck goes towards. So my mortgage payment, my, my, my paying myself first. Uh, so my tax-free savings account, my kid's education, uh, any debt repayment that I have, whatever is left in that checking account is essentially my spending money or my, my discretionary spending. And what that does is it really forces things out and, and keeps you on track to those goals that we talked about earlier. I use my brother as uh, he never listens to his big brother. He's my younger brother, two years younger than me. Since he's been 22, he's been making a lot more money than I have. He's been making around, I'll say on average, $80,000 over the last eight years um, doing plumbing, et cetera. Didn't, didn't have to have a, a student loan or anything along those lines. And he didn't listen to any of my advice. And he has a checking account, a credit card, and a mortgage, and he has $0 to show for it, even though he lived with my parents for four years. He, they helped him with the down payment, et cetera. I'm not resentful. Um, etc. But he has nothing to show for because he really didn't use that zero-based budgeting principle that, that I suggested to him. The other thing, the last point there was stay curious and continue to read uh, for long-term financial health. Just like anything, continuing education is very important and where financial planning, investing is not taught in, in, in schools like high school and I really think it should. I think Ontario actually, I think it's part of the curriculum now. But anyways, because it's not, uh, it's really important on yourself to, to make sure that you're learning for yourself and your long-term financial health. I guess the last thing quickly in budgeting that I could mention, I think Allison will mention ratios that the banks or credit unions or brokers will, will try to qualify you on. The, 
these these guidelines are what I use, not to say it's what the bank will qualify you for, but it's the way that I've found I've been able to force myself to keep on putting money away. So that advice is 35% of your net pay should go to housing. Typically a bank will do 30, 36% of your gross pay, so, so there is a difference there. Um, 5% towards utilities, 10 to 20% towards food, probably dependent on how many people are in your household. 15 to 20% on transportation. Quick caveat there, as a, as, a, as a student, when I had first graduated, the last thing I did was buy a new vehicle. I mean, there's many other ways of travel. Um, so whether that be public transit, whether that be cart pooling, whether that be buying a used car for $5,000 to get you through the next five years, um, very important because that's five to 20% of the industry standard. And so then as a result, that's all gravy that goes towards savings similar to your cable bill for your down payment. Um, just food for thought. If you want to buy a new car, buy a new car. Uh, however, like I told you the story with my father and my, and my, and, and I guess my mom's siblings, but our family in, in Regina, Saskatchewan, you know, they always had the big, nice things. They made six-figure salaries, yet they had nothing to show for it. And now I've come to my dad, who maybe made on average 30 grand a year um, for loans. And, and that kind of brings me to my next slide. How did my dad do it? How could he save so much money? So again, paying yourself first is one thing that's so important. As a young, as a young alumni yourselves, you guys are younger than me, um, you guys have time on, on your side, and that's very, very important, and, and I'll allude to it all in these slides here. Um, so what is the power of compounding? So compound interest is really a math concept that shows the power of making interest on not just your principal, but also interest. So there's three ways to calculate the power of compound interest. The Wealthy Barber speaks about it as well. Um, but you could do it through a spreadsheet. We all know how to make spreadsheets, I would hope, after graduating university. You could do it through a financial calculator. There's tons of time value money calculators. Anyone that took a finance class at CBU, I'm not too sure who the professors are, but they would have told you the time and value of money. So you have time on your side. That's A1. You know, and that's what my dad did from that young age is he started putting little bits away and it started to add up. And then the other way that you can calculate it is on a napkin of sorts is, is the rule of 72. So that's essentially taking the interest you're earning, divide it by 72, and that's the length of time it will take to double your money, uh, if, you, if you care. So a couple things to keep in mind. Like I said, you have time. Time is so important. Regular investing, so the frequency of your regular investing, paying yourself first, making it a bill payment, so very important. And then the frequency of the compounding. So, you know, more frequency of compounding. Regular interest rates will be, you know, regular interest rates will be annual compound rates. However, you know, if you do a dividend reinvest program, which is another type of, of compounding, uh, you know, that might be quarterly. So, just, just so we're aware there, I'll, I'll talk quickly here about now the diagram or the picture. So, I'll just use my mouse. So here is 25 year old saved $1,000 a year for 10 years, age 25 to 34. He earned 8% interest, so a lot higher than our interest rate environment today. Uh, most likely you're not getting a term deposit for that. But so out of a total $10,000, his investments at the time of 60, oh nice. His investments at the time of, of 65 was $157,000. The gentleman underneath, oh, I like that, that's nice. The gentleman underneath started investing at 35. He saved $1,000 a year for 30 years. Same interest rate. He invested $20,000 more, so $30,000 in total, and at 65, he only had $122,000. Very, very, very powerful stuff. Time, regular frequency. The person at 25 actually had more money and put less money in. Uh, uh, quite powerful. Another example, I don't want to just bore you guys with examples, but it's such a, it's such a prominent factor in long-term investing. So we got Aaron in the green. Thank you, sir. 
We got Aaron in the green, so he begins saving at 20, so $2,000 for 10 years. So he set aside 20,000. We got Bobby. Bob begins saving at 30. He saves $2,000 for 35 years, so he sets aside 70,000. And we got Carl. He's 40. Saves $2,000 for 25 years, so 50,000. And again, the time and the value of that money keeps on increasing, or I should say the time allows the value of the money to keep on increasing for Aaron, even though he contributed the least amount of money. And then the last one here, uh, again, just another example. Investor one set, starts at uh, 25, sets aside $5,000 per year for 10 years. No investment after age 34. And then we have the other investor, number two, too bad they didn't give them names. Starts at the age of 35, sets aside $5,000 for 30 years, and again, our investor one, Nancy in this case, she um, still had more money even though she stopped at the age of 34 to invest. So, so again, just on the just on the power of compounding, I think that's very important. And I guess it's something I didn't allude to in the last part about the budgeting was, well, how much, Yanni, do I contribute to my savings account? How much is how much is enough? What what should I do? What's the, you know, what's sought after? So again, every there's there's different advice pieces, but the generic ones that I've heard over the years is five to ten percent should go to savings. I like to make it fifteen, but anyways, five to ten percent to go to savings, and then five to fifteen percent dependent should go to debt repayment. So it really should be a balancing act. You shouldn't just pay down debt. It should be a balancing act as you grow. Um, you know, throughout your life cycle. Most students will have more debt than, than you know, my parents, even though my mom does buy a lot of, a lot of things for my kids and I, uh, anyways, for another day. So that's, that's quickly on the budgeting and the power of compounding. Again, you should have a budget. It, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be something that consumes your life. Uh, but at the start, you know, it's always good to go back against what you budgeted and what was your actual expenses and just keep on revisiting there. Is there any discretionary funds that I can cut out of my life that I don't need for my lifestyle to be able to save more money, um, you know, for that home that Allison's going to talk about soon? Credit and advice. So credit, again, isn't something that's typically taught. We, we become university students, and if we don't have a scholarship, we get a student loan or we get a student line of credit or something along those lines. Essentially, it's borrowed money that it's an obligation that needs to be paid back. So good loans versus bad loans. Um, you know, a good loan could be a mortgage uh, because a mortgage is secured by a home. So I bought an asset that I'm borrowing against. Uh, so when I'm finished paying down that loan, I have something tangible that, that is mine and that's my home. And again, Allison will get into more of those details, but that home is that biggest purchase, uh, buying land, even buying a vehicle eventually, hopefully not right after school unless it's required. Even buying a vehicle isn't a terrible loan. Um, you know, it depends on the interest rate, you know, we could get into should I lease, should I, should I, should I lease, should I finance, et cetera. But, but those are good loans in my opinion. Consolidation loans sometimes can be good loans to consolidate some high interest credit cards and start an actual repayment plan on those credit cards because the credit cards are probably going to be at 19 to 29% on average. And obviously it's going to be hard to pay more of the principal if the interest rates all consuming. So then what's a bad loan? Uh, so a bad loan you know, it's something that's difficult to repay, has a lot of hidden fees, it's very difficult to get out of. My opinion, payday loans, uh, if anyone's watched, I can't recall, the Netflix show, I think it's called Dirty Money. Uh, there is one on payday loans. You should watch that. It was scary. I think the interest rate that they quoted, don't quote me on it, but the interest rate I think that they quoted was something like 400%. Uh, interest rate and it could almost never get repaid and probably one of the reasons that it was on Netflix for dirty money. Uh, so that would be a bad loan. Loan from pawn shops, you know, probably not a great place to go get a loan. I'm not trying to be uh, sarcastic, obviously not. Um, credit card cash advances, 
you know, if you really need the cash and, and, and you have to do that, fine. You know, there's always extenuating circumstances. However, you know, you're getting a cash advance at 29%, then they charge you the fees on top of that, uh, you know, to take out the money of the cash advance. And, and really, it's going to be very hard to pay it back. Some of my rules of thumb as it pertains to credit cards is don't put it on your credit card if you can't pay it back. Easier said than done sometimes, totally understand that. Um, and so then that's, that leads me to my, I guess, a piece of advice would be if you're going to spend money on your credit card and you can't pay it back, I hope you should have a line of credit that you can lend it to. Line of credit is typically at a lesser rate than a credit card. So again, back to the advice. If you can't pay off your credit card, you probably shouldn't buy it. If you can't pay it off with that interest-free grace period of 21 days that a credit card usually gives you, you probably shouldn't have it. Needs versus wants. Um, again, extenuating circumstances, if there's an issue with health or family or something needed to get done, I, I'm not trying to, I'm just generally speaking. And if you can't pay down that credit card in full, you should really lend it to your line of credit at a, at a more favorable rate, but really also have a repayment plan to that line of credit. Put uh, prioritizing student debt. And I just put prioritizing mainly because in my experience, we tend to forget about the student debt, maybe because you know the federal government or the province or your, or your bank or credit union has, has deferred those payments for so long where you're only required to pay interest. And then as you graduate, you're not actually required to repay it for a certain amount of time and, and you forget about it. Um, so don't forget about the student debt um, have a repayment plan for it, have the plan, order it in level of priority or importance, and, and start repaying it. Uh, a couple reasons for that. You know, you're going to be able to qualify for more money on your mortgage, which Allison will speak to, if the student debt was paid. Um, but again, like I told you, with the power of compounding, it's a balancing act. Um, you know, you really do want to save because you have time on your hand and that money is going to make money. Um, and so it's important that you do that as well. My experience on student loans, and, and yes, I had student loans. I decided to, to move to Cape Breton to play on the soccer team. And uh, yeah, albeit I had a little bit of a scholarship, it was expensive. My, my experience with my student loans is I had the chance to still live in my parents' basement for three to four months, I think it was. And every paycheck went to my student loan until it was, until it was paid. And then I moved out. Uh, to Newfoundland. I, I moved from Regina, I, I went to CBU from Regina, Saskatchewan, moved back to Regina, Saskatchewan, started working at Scotiabank, paid off my student loan, moved to St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, goes to show how much I like the prairies. So now let's talk about credit bureau and controlling credit. Um, again, not rocket science. However, Anytime a mortgage professional or a bank or a credit union is looking to qualify you, they look at your credit score. Um, and so we pull two scores, actually, uh, only recently, I think a couple of years ago. We pull the generic credit score that you can get either on Credit Karma or, or on a banking app. You can pull your TransUnion score. But we also pull a bankruptcy navigation score, which, which tells us what's the probability of someone going bankrupt. And I guess the point to that is, just because you make $150,000 or $200,000 doesn't mean you can afford your lifestyle. Back to my dad's story. Uh, so as a result, we pulled two scores. A um, couple of things that we find in, in, our, in our field that ruin people's credit is cell bills that are never paid on time, cable bills, power bills that judgments are now on your on your credit bureau because for whatever reason, you know, you say you moved and you forgot to close out the one bill and you opened up a new, a new account with Nova Scotia Power, or Newfoundland Power, whatever. I honestly, I, I see that, uh, I wanna say daily, but uh, I don't do personal banking as much anymore. So I'll say weekly. I see that weekly and that, that hinders someone, almost cripples someone from getting, from getting a mortgage uh, because of something so simple, a $50 cell bill or a $100 um, internet bill or whatever the case is, and then you got a judgment. And then you got to figure out who the collection company is that I have to call to pay this bill out. 
Um, so that that ruins people's credit. Something so simple that could be that could have been dealt with. Again, I talk. Don't use your credit card if you can't pay. Uh, the other thing that that brings credit bureaus down is you know if you have a credit card limit of ten thousand dollars and you're always at that limit, um, that that brings the the credit score down significantly. Um, so I guess my my advice to that is guard your credit with your life. Check it often. Pay your bills. Uh, when they're due, and, and you should be fine. Um, from, from a reestablishing credit, and maybe there'll be questions, I'm not sure, uh, but from a reestablishing credit or my credit, you know, I didn't, le I didn't learn from you, Yanni, quick enough, but now I want to reestablish my credit. There's ways to do that. There's ways to do that. So, you know, it could be something as simple as I paid off whatever was owed, whatever I owed, so my, my cell bill and my my credit cards, and and I got a $500 credit card from Capital One that I used to buy a stick of gum, and then I repay it right away. So I bought my stick of gum. I hope you get more sticks than, than one stick of gum, and and you repay it, and I repay it, and I and I went to the grocery store, and I've already paid my card. So I'm always at zero, essentially, when the credit bureau is, is checking my credit, or when, I guess, the credit card provider is reporting to the credit bureau, or when Equifax is pulling from the credit card provider. But it's always paid and it's frequent and I'm always on time. The other thing that, that can be done is a secured uh, loan. So say I get a $500 loan from Sydney Credit Union secured by $500 of cash and I pay it over the course of a year. So then it shows that I have a, you know, a repaid card of sorts. There's always these, these questions I get when I'm working. Some of them are, well, I have so many hits on my credit scores so, and that's why my credit's bad. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Uh, the only thing I usually look for when I pull a credit bureau is how many inquiries has the individual had. So if Allison went to every single banking institution, then to a mortgage broker, and then came to the credit union as the last stop, and I can see all those inquiries in like a three-month period, I'm asking myself, well, what gives? Like, why didn't the first person approve the mortgage, like there's something more that I need to dig. There's too many inquiries. They're seeking credit too much. Um, so th that's the only thing that I usually look at. But I'll tell you, we've cleaned up a lot of people's credit scores just by that simple advice. Um, it could even have been just a consolidation loan to get themselves back on track. And the next year we pull the score and they're ready to buy a home. We find, we find a lot of times, whether you're ready this year or next year, if you follow our advice in, in the first year, come next year, you're always ready. And so we have a lot of good news stories here at the credit union with regard to that, um, because we do, we do like to put our members first from that perspective. I, I say needs and wants and non-discretionary, discretionary spending quite a bit, I apologize. There's gotta be sacrifice. Uh, so, you know, you don't need to go to the Capri and, and spend $200 and take a cab to McDonald's and spend $40 there. And you probably don't eat all your McDonald's anyways because you're passed out on the way home. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of having one cider and then going for a walk or finding some sort of frugal fun with your wife, whether that's to go for a hike, et cetera. It doesn't always have to be uh, such a lucrative uh, trip. You know, we just graduated. We're just, we're just getting started. And so setting yourself up right is, uh, is of paramount importance. And so I think I covered a lot, uh, probably probably a little long-winded, probably a bit quick, uh, but I did want to share just some, some resources that I think, you know, may help you in your endeavors. So the Wealthy Barber Returns, I think, first and foremost, it, it, it is, very, is very important to read. It's an easy read. Um, it took me maybe, maybe, you know, a couple days to read it. It really taught me a lot. Uh, you know, and, and in the return section specifically, it gets into it gets into tax-free savings accounts, which I didn't talk about. So if you're going to do the power of compounding, you really should do it in a tax-free savings account because anything you earn in a tax-free savings account is tax-free, hence the name, and you can withdraw at any time without a penalty. Um, Think and Grow Rich. So Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, one of the best sellers of all time. Um, Outwitting the Devil, Napoleon Hill, and The Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill. Just listen to all of those in like a one, one month span. Uh, you know, I found them to be quite powerful from a self-help perspective and also that money that shouldn't control 
uh, the principles of success or the laws of success. It's only one piece of it all. You know, other things like positive outlook, definiteness of purpose, don't be a drifter, all those kind of things also came in came into play. Some choices matter, the credit union difference. I have a video there, it'll be shared with you guys after. It just talks about the difference between what's a credit union and what's a bank, because uh, there is a difference. We provide banking products, but we're, we're about something a lot more. And then the budgeting tool that I briefly showed you guys with the guidelines and industry standards, just to help. Uh, that's the one I use, well, not so much anymore, but that's the one my wife uses uh, a lot. And, and, and I think it would benefit you guys if you haven't had a budget, but even taking a little scribble piece of paper, I'm getting paid $1,000 a week. This is my, these are my expenses. This is what's left over. This is how much I'm saving. This is how much of a home I want to be able to afford. You know, how long do I have to go, et cetera. And there, there's the contact information for the credit union. Most of those are generic. The email is generic. That's my phone number, 902-567-6528. I urge you guys to reach out. I, I love nothing more than to help people be successful and to realize their dreams from a financial perspective, but also, uh, you know, I get very involved in, in personal success and I love to see it. And so, so, you know, if you have questions or you're curious about something or you just blab for so long and you, hit, you missed the point I wanted to hear, uh, give me a call. We'll have a chat. We'll social distance, we'll go out for a coffee at Dr. Luke's to support some local business, and we'll stand far enough back so I can answer your questions the best I can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yanni. That was, uh, that was a lot of information, and I think it's a lot of valuable information. Uh, we recently did a project with Yanni and the uh, credit union here at the partnership, and what Yanni was known for is his uh, his real desire to see Cape Breton thrive and to see our community prosper. And so I know that he means it when he says, please reach out if you have any questions, uh, because he wants to see CBU alumni prosper as well. So thank you so much, Yanni. Uh, our next panelist graduated from CBU with a Bachelor of Science degree in 2005. She's been working as a mortgage broker with Premier Mortgage Center for eight years. She currently resides in Sydney River and has an office in Sydney, so she's definitely accessible. So uh, well, welcome to the video, Allison Unsworth. Oh, you're muted, Allison. There we go. Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> thanks so much, Robin Lee, for the introduction. And thanks again for having me to the Cape Breton Partnership and CBU alumni. Right. So just bear with me one second while I share my screen. Yeah. All right, so um, as Robin Lee mentioned, I'm a mortgage broker and as a mortgage broker, I work with a variety of lenders to figure out the best fit for you, depending on your current and future needs. So we work, um, work together to figure out what terms and conditions of the mortgage will best suit you. So I'm just going to briefly discuss the steps to the home buying process, and then I'm going to kind of nail down more on what I do as a mortgage broker and what it takes to qualify for a mortgage. So the first step would be to meet with a mortgage professional, such as myself or a bank, to determine how much you can afford for your mortgage. Uh, once you've done that and you have a pre-approval in place, you can choose a realtor to help find you a suitable home. Once you find uh, your home that you want to offer on, um, the realtor will help you, help you make the offers, negotiate the price. Um, once the final offer is accepted, then you'll have to have the home inspected, get home insurance in place, and then lastly, you'll speak with a lawyer to handle your purchase transaction. So some different mortgage qualifying criteria that I'm going to talk about are different types of income, uh, down payment, uh, how much is required and the sources of down payment that are allowable, your debt service ratios, 
credit, which Janie already discussed in, in pretty good detail, but I'll touch on that a little bit again. Um, mortgage default insurance, what it is, why it's required, um, and some different mortgage terms that you may hear discussed. So we'll start with income. Um, as new grads or, or anyone that's recently graduated from university, you might wonder what it takes um, in terms of employment and types of income that you can use to qualify for a mortgage. So um, there's salaried employees versus hourly employees. So if you're a salaried employee, meaning that your income is the exact same every pay, um, what we would use would be usually a letter of employment and a pay stub. Uh, the only real requirement um, in terms of length of employment is that you've passed your probationary period, if there is one, in your line of work. If you're hourly and your hours are guaranteed hours, we can also use a pay stub and letter of employment for that as well, assuming that, again, you've passed your probationary period. If you're hourly and your incomes, or, and your hours fluctuate, um, depending on the week or the season, uh, then we have to look at a two-year average of your income. So we'd look at either your T4s for the last two years or your notice of assessments to determine an average of your income, as well as a recent pay stub. If you work any overtime, um, in order to use that overtime to help you qualify, we would need a two-year history of that as well. Uh, for self-employment, if you own your own company or in any type of partnership or an incorporated company, um, we need a two-year history, a two-year income tax history. So we need to see two years of income tax returns and notice of assessments in order to use that income. Uh, pension income is allowable as well, not probably not um, relevant to any of you yet, but at some point um, we can use pension income. Um, CPP, uh, Canada pension, or pension from your employer. Seasonal income is treated similar to, to self-employed income or fluctuating hourly income, whereas we need a two-year average to be able to use the seasonal income. So fishing, uh, farming in Cape Breton, there's a lot of tourism industries that are seasonal. So we would need a two-year two -year history in that line of work. Uh, some other income that we can use without getting into too much specifics would be child, child tax credit, um, child or spousal support, or rental income if you're purchasing a property with a rental unit or if you own another property that, that gets rental income. Uh, so in terms of down payment, the, a down payment is required on every house purchase. The minimum down payment required is 5%. Um, and you can pay up to as much as I guess you can afford, but the minimum will be 5%. So different sources that you can get that down payment from would be savings, like Yanni mentioned, um, different bank account balances, tax-free savings, RSP or investment accounts. Um, we would just need a 90-day history of that account to ensure that the money has been in that account um, and just kind of to see where it's been coming from. You can also have a, a gift from a parent, a grandparent, or a sibling, and we can use that for your 5% down payment. Borrowed funds are allowable by some lenders, not all, uh, meaning you could borrow from a line of credit or you can use like the Nova Scotia Down Payment Assistance Program to um, get the down payment for your mortgage. You do have to keep in mind that you have to be able to qualify for the mortgage amount as well as the loan payment or the grant payment if it's a Nova Scotia Down Payment Assistance Program. Um, so you have to be qualified to, to be able to pay both of those within the limits of your income. And last but not least, the sale of another property. If you're, if you're buying another, selling one home to purchase another, you can use the proceeds of the sale to buy a home. So I'm gonna get into a little bit of debt servicing ratios. It's not the most exciting stuff in the world, but I'll just talk a little bit about, about it. So there's two different um, ratios that we use to determine what you can qualify for for a mortgage, the gross debt service ratio and the total debt service ratio. So the gross debt service ratio relates to your home's home, cost to own a home, being your mortgage, principal and interest, 
property taxes, heating costs, and if it's a condo, we have to use 50% of the condo fees. And the maximum um, GDS is ranges from 35 to 39 percent. So the reason why there's a range is it depends by on the lender and it depends on the mortgage default insurer, which I'll speak about in a second. So the total debt service ratio is all of, everything that's included in your gross debt service ratio plus any other debts that you have. So if you have car payments, uh, lines of credit, student debt, credit cards, anything like that. So the maximum total debt service would be uh, 42 to 44% depending on the lender and the insurer. So I just have a little uh, example here where we can break it down. So this is based on someone that makes a gross monthly income of 3,500 a month. So of that 3,500, we can't go over 39% um, of it to be used to service the gross, um, to be to used to be service your home expenses. So mortgage payments, property taxes, heating costs, or condo fees. So in this case, the principal and interest will be 915, heating costs 75, and property taxes 125. And that works out to 31.8% of their total, um, their total income being used to service those debts. And in this case, they don't have a whole lot of other debt. They have a small car loan payment of $200 and credit card payments of $50. So when you add those in, the total debt service ratio is 39%, which falls in line to be able to afford that mortgage payment of the 915 59 a month. So credit, Yanni spoke a lot about credit, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how it relates to mortgage qualifying. So the minimum credit score required to qualify for a mortgage um, ranges from, depending, it depends on the lender and the mortgage default insurer, so it ranges from 600 to 680. Uh, keep in mind that 600 is relatively low, um, and usually anyone who has a 600 credit score either has, either has brand new credit or has some things that are negatively impacting their credit. Um, and most lenders require two credit products for two years or more before they would lend um, would lend you money for a mortgage. So like Yanni said, the best options for you would be car loans, student debt, if you have it, would count towards it, credit cards, uh, consolidation loans. Um, do keep in mind, I also see, like Yanni does, is um, cell phone bills in collections on credit bureaus often, and they would have to be paid before you would be able to get a mortgage. Even if you miss your payments on your cell phone bill, that also reflects on your credit bureau. So just keep that in mind. So mortgage default insurance, which I've mentioned a little bit in the presentation, is an insurance that's required on all purchases in Canada with down payments of 20% or less. So what that insurance does is it protects the lender that if you were to default on your mortgage, the lender would still get paid and the insurance company would then be responsible for recouping their losses by foreclosing on the house and, and selling the property. So if you don't have 20% or more for your down payment, you're required to have mortgage default insurance on your mortgage and it is added to the mortgage and paid down with it. So it's not something that you have to pay out of pocket upfront. And there are three different mortgage default insurers in Canada, CMHC, Genworth and Canada Guarantee. CMHC, um, just in the last couple of weeks, tightened up the rules in terms of minimum credit score. They're the, they switched from 600 to 680. Um, and their total debt service ratio dropped from 44 to 42%. But the other two, Genworth and Canada Guarantee, came out and said this week that they're not planning to make any changes, so fingers crossed that they'll be able to keep their ratios and their minimum credit scores where they have been. So some different mortgage terms to consider um, when you're trying to decide which lender you're gonna choose, um, or what different terms you want to take into consideration is the amortization of your mortgage. That's a total amount of time that it's going to take to pay your mortgage. So if it's insured, meaning you have less than 20% for the down payment, the maximum amount of time you can take is 25 years. If it's uninsured, meaning a conventional mortgage, uh, you can go up to 30 years with most lenders. 
the mortgage term um, would be if you're taking like the average term is a five year fixed rate term that people take, but there's open and closed mortgages, meaning if, if you're getting a home and you're not sure if you're gonna have to sell it in the short term, you might wanna consider an open term mortgage so you don't have a penalty to break it. Um, closed term is what most people take as it comes with lower interest rates. And then there's fixed rates versus variable interest rates. Um, Variable fluctuates based on the prime lending rate, where the fixed, you know exactly what your payment's gonna be for that period of time, whether it be a one-year term, five-year term, 10-year term. And then the length of term would be, um, there's terms from one, two, three, four, five years, seven years, and 10 years. And then prepayment privileges is, something to consider too. Um, although you may have no intentions of breaking your mortgage, if you take a five-year fixed term, the average mortgage does break at about 3.8 years, I think it is. So if you have to pay a penalty to break your mortgage, um, you wanna figure out how lenders calculate their penalties because some have higher prepayment penalties than others do. But most lenders do allow you to prepay at least 15% per year on your mortgage without penalty. And then some other costs to consider um, when you're buying a home would be insurances on your mortgage, life, disability, disability or critical illness insurance. So if you're buying a home, you wanna make sure that your mortgage is covered. Um, with life insurance and then depending on what you have um, with your employer, if you have disability insurance or critical illness insurance. Closing costs. So in the CDRM, um, the land or deed transfer tax is 1.5% of the purchase price of the home. And then you'd have your legal fees, um, fees to register title, title insurance, those expenses they have to consider when you're buying a home. Moving expenses, um, such as the cost to move, um, getting utilities connected, those types of things. Home insurance, property taxes are something to consider. They can be added into your mortgage, um, but it's added on top of your mortgage principal and interest. And then costs related to owning a home. So heating costs, utilities, internet, cable, repairs and maintenance of owning a home. So you do wanna have, like Annie mentioned, um, a bit of savings in place in case your hot water tank breaks or your furnace is no longer working. Um, so it's good to have savings in place to cover the costs related to that. So I know I went really quickly through that. Um, Yanni was a little bit more long-winded. So in essence of time, I decided to kind of speed through it, but um, it, feel free to reach out at any point if you have any questions at all. My contact information is there. A link to my website um, where you can find an application online is there. So feel free to reach out at any point and I'd be happy to help. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. That was really generous and informative. Uh, and I, I definitely learned a lot. Uh, Jeremy, you're on the screen. Did you want to say something? No, I had a text from you that said maybe jump in for a second. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So that wraps up our, our presentations. In for the sake of time, we are not going to open up to questions, but we are going to be sending all of our participants this video and the contact information for Allison and for Yanni. So if you're looking, <laughs> if you're looking for information, uh, it's coming your way. Uh, so now I'll just turn it over to Rochelle who wants to say a few words. Great, thanks everyone. So Allison and Yanni, that was a great presentation. I honestly want to get outside, but however, I have to tell you both that I want more information. So I feel like I learned so much already. I'm not a new grad for sure by any means, but I think that a lot of the information uh, was great. Annie, it was great to hear about your dad, you know, saving while you're young. I'm 43. I think that I wish I had started a little bit sooner. 
And I think it's never too late either. So that was some great information. And Allison, hearing about, you know, salary versus hourly and, you know, what are some of the things to start now to like everybody, you know, I think that has goals. And if, if your goal is to own a home, now's the time to start. We're going to um, end this a little bit early, but what I'm going to do is within the next, you know, probably tomorrow or Monday at the latest, I'm going to share the link to this recording so everybody can go back. Um, I know I'm going to rewatch it because there's a few things that I want to pick up on. And what we're going to do is connect everyone to Allison and Yanni. So if you want to talk with somebody at the Sydney Credit Union about, you know, savings or, or learning some more financial information, if you're looking to purchase a house in the near future, you have a few questions for Allison, you want to drop her a quick email, we're going to make sure that you have all their contact information. I know there was a few questions there, um, and we're going to make sure that you have that so you can definitely reach out to them personally. Um, as a CBU alumni and representing our CBU alumni, the fact that we can access our experts like this really means a lot. So Alice and Yanni, thank you so much. Um, you did a great presentation. We're really proud. So great. Over to you, Robin Lee. Awesome. Okay. So I uh, thank you all again for joining us. Uh, thank you to CBU alumni for being our partner on this. Uh, if any of you are new grads and are looking to get connected in the local community, please email uh, me. It's, I'll put it in, uh, no, we'll send it around. Um, email me at connector at capebrightonpartnership.com uh, and we'll help you out. Thank you to Yanni, thank you to Allison, thank you to Rochelle. Everyone have a great afternoon.